and he said it's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So my duty is to welcome those participants mm -hmm. and those who are online. Uh, who, who are basically the candidates. Collins, Collins, we need to have it just here. Like this. Okay. When it is here. When it is here. Here. Do you need? Can you hear me? Out of science? Hmm? Really? Since when? We have had from staff. Um, thank you so much. You're all welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, Judith Atkund is my name and I'll be your MC for this session. Uh, we welcome you participants, lecturers and students from Kavala University and our online uh, participants. You're all welcome to this public lecture. Uh, uh, we shall have a brief, prog a brief program whereby we we shall have our welcoming remarks, prayer. Then we shall have opening remarks from our Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs. Uh, thereafter, we are going to have um, remarks from the Dean, um, Faculty of Science, who will also introduce our presenter of the day. And then our closing remarks, which will be from our Vice Chancellor. 
We are very happy to attend uh, this lecture where our theme today is um, simplifying chemistry, the role of chemistry in our daily lives. We are going to see what chemistry does in our daily activities. And so I believe by the time we live here, all we have learned something from this public lecture. We want to thank the organizers for having brought this um, to us. And I think this is uh, our first public lecture uh, 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 after the inaugural lecture, which was earlier, like two years' time given by uh, our DVC uh, of academic affairs. So you're all welcome. Uh, we are going to have our opening prayer by uh, one of our participants. Uh, this is um, Tulihawe. Tuliha Please, can you have our opening prayer? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Tulihawe. Um, next on our program, we are going to connect to our DVC, Academic Affairs, who is going to deliver his opening remarks to this lecture. We thank you. Meanwhile, members, we can, okay. Thank you, Professor, for the guidance. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome uh, the members once again, uh, those who are present and those who are online. Uh, we are for the day for the day in starting uh, this public lecture. for the play uh, start in this public lecture. Uh, as you have been informed uh, by uh, communications and branding officer, uh, the public lecture is about chemistry and it is the first uh, public lecture we are having at Kavar University. It has been organized uh, by Faculty of Science and uh, we hope this will encourage other staff members to organize public lectures so that we have the culture of having public lectures at Kavari University. Uh, chemistry is an interesting field uh, for those who have studied it and those who haven't. Uh, it is seen as an abstract subject, but it has lots of applications in our daily lives as we listen to the presenter. So I wish to thank uh, Dr. Mukasa uh, for coming forward and preparing this lecture. Uh, just a brief uh, profile about Dr. Mukasa uh, before he comes forward to give his presentation. Uh, Dr. Mukasa Tabandeke 
is a seasoned chemist with over 30 years of teaching and research experience in the field of chemistry. His journey started in the late 80s when he obtained his BSc in Chemistry Z in 1987. Uh, later, in 1988, he obtained a postgraduate diploma in education and was posted as a secondary school teacher. In 1992, he was appointed a teaching assistant at Makere University, a position he held until 2012. Uh, Dr. Mukasa received his MSc in chemistry in 1997 and later a PhD in chemistry from Makere University in 2017. Uh, he has worked at the Department of Chemistry at Kawari University since 2019, and here at Kawari University he teaches basic physical chemistry, basic organic chemistry, electrochemistry, transition chemistry, collide sciences, and polymer chemistry. So we are really happy to have Dr. Mukasa at Kawara University and in the Faculty of Science. And without wasting much time, I know people have been waiting online for a long time. I will invite Dr. Mukasa uh, to give his lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Uh, protocol observed. Members online and members uh, present in the computer lab, you are very welcome to this presentation. Thank you for turning up and uh, showing the interest, the great interest you have shown in the cause of appreciating the role of chemistry in our daily life. Uh, chemistry, by definition, uh, is a subject that deals with the, the properties of matter. And I hope you all know that matter exists in three interconvertible states, and the solid, the liquid, the gas. And of course, most of what we talk of as chemistry will involve reactions in the solid, in the liquid, the gaseous and other states uh, which can arise as uh, intermediaries uh, set up. Our concern today is to look at chemistry in our day-to-day -day life and uh, therefore we should know, one, that chemistry is a core subject that hinges or that derives or that thrives in between two boundaries biological and the physical. So if somebody is talking about chemistry, you should know that there is no limit for chemistry intercepting areas in physics, just as it is no, uh, there is no boundary between chemistry and biology. Many of the aspects we associate with in chemistry relate to these fields, and we should appreciate that chemistry also provides an appreciation or, or derives information from both the geological, environmental, and aspects to do with uh, the in human intelligence, forensic science, are all particularly related to the field of chemistry. Uh, we should know that uh, in the chemical terms, we always presume that whatever is chemical exists and whatever exists is made of a chemical component and therefore we should appreciate there are many aspects that relate to our daily experiences and are related to the chemistry. However, we should be able to have a glance at some such features that happen in our midst 
and are related to chemistry. One, one may not observe, or we may know, we, have, we feel what we feel like, that is to say our emotions. Uh, one should be able to observe that when you put ice on water, it will float. The other aspect is to also feel that mm -hmm. when you, uh, the other wonderful thing is to know uh, that soaps can clean. And another aspect to think about is why in baking, the materials we bake have to rise. Sincerely, all those aspects we are talking about, you may not be able to bake, but you have seen somebody bake it. You may not be able to cut the onions, but you have seen somebody cutting the onions. So you have the experience of those chemicals entering you and changing your life. Definitely, we should be also able to appreciate that human beings are composed of chemical elements. When we talk of the elements, one would wonder which element. The biggest component of a human being is, is actually oxygen, followed by carbon. The other elements, they may not occur as elements, but they occur naturally as compounds. As shown over there, you should know that a human being is 62% water. The components of water are hydrogen and oxygen. So sincerely, if you are not a chemical, then you are yourself a compound. <laughs> the other aspect is we actually appreciate that we have carbohydrates and proteins within our bodies, and therefore these are biological chemicals, but they are themselves chemicals, and therefore they are part of chemistry. So the human being is himself built on the principle of the elements that we actually see in the periodic table. Okay? If the elements in the periodic table constitute a human being, these elements have also been classified into groups. We have those that are essential or those that are major, then we have those that are essential and those that are trace. Among the essential elements, we mention of carbon and uh, hydrogen uh, as well as oxygen, but we should know there are elements that are so important in our bodies and these constitute a major, or they constitute the or they facilitate reactions within the bodies with, uh, by, which the, the, by which the body functions. For instance, zinc is known to uh, be at the center of our intelligence. That one simple element. And uh, you should also appreciate that there are also trace elements. Uh, if deficient in our bodies, they, you, you would actually suffer diseases in the absence of those elements. And therefore, whether they, or, uh, they occur as trace elements, they are actually very vital for the smooth running of our day-to-day -day human uh, or life processes. Uh, the aspects to do, or the relationship of these elements is brought out in what we refer to as nutrition. Uh, by nutrition, I believe that every one of us gathered here or hearing me knows that we must feed on materials that must keep our lives going. And I have we have all known that it's very important that we have balanced diet. And the scientists have already documented that a diet rich in fruits and vegetables is the most healthy for the human beings. I wonder how you could be there to only feed on carbohydrates and feel that your life would be very good, but rather you need to balance and please ensure you have a big bulk of the materials you feed on are uh, constituted by the fruits and vegetables for reasons we are yet to see. As we have said, among the nutrients we take are carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, uh, minerals, or mineral salts, water, and, what, and many other components. Uh, of course, these components, these components would have or, or serve different purposes within our bodies. Slide. These, these components have different purposes within our bodies, and as can be seen from that image, uh, the minerals and vital and their vital roles in our bodies uh, could be emphasized by a few such aspects. As one, I talked about a, a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, whereof the fruits and vegetables supply the antioxidants, and. I believe that if you have never heard of antioxidants, you should be aware that if you are 
having tomatoes, it would be wise to have them fresh. Because the richest plant we have, the tomato fruit, has the, richest, has the highest content of antioxidants that can be of good use to the human health. And therefore, uh, we could do, have, uh, have cancers stopped or reduced by the eating of materials rich in antioxidants. Similarly, many other minerals are important, but you should do not forget the fact that these minerals work hand in hand, and therefore you need to have a very good diet rich in the carbohydrates, and as well as the proteins, as well as the essential components. The health benefits of minerals it may, will include, of course, uh, the fact that you, we shall have uh, such components such as minerals, potassium and sodium, which are very useful in uh, uh, the nervous system, uh, magnesium and phosphorus and zinc, phosphorus and calcium are very vital in uh, the functioning of the bones, uh, regulation of pressure and other activities, and uh, we should do, certainly be sure that uh, we have materials that are green. Next, Next please. Uh, as we look at our nutrients, or as we try to look at our foodstuffs, we should know that foods rich in iron and foods rich in zinc are highly desirable, and therefore the nutrition, or anyone trying to choose what to eat for the day, should have components uh, arising from the list given over there. Uh, of course, we should also know that iodine and other elements such as selenium perform uh, very important functions in our bodies. For example, we actually know that iodine is part of uh, the, the hormone uh, produced by the thyroid glands and in, uh, iodine is therefore very important in the fighting goiter, uh, in which case, therefore, uh, one must not miss out such food nutrients that would otherwise help the body mechanism to work well. As uh, we observe very well, we should do, uh, be in position to also notice that uh, foods rich in chromium and fluorine uh, can be as simple as, well, you may not need to know that the food item you are taking contains such and such an element, but the chemists have already gone ahead and shown that the various uh, components displayed over there, or the various food items displayed onto this, that slide, actually serve as good sources for the chromium and the fluoride. You should know, or you should recall, that the fluoride is responsible for the hardening of the enamel of the teeth, uh, just as chromium is very essential in uh, the aspects to do with the good life. Uh, we should do also appreciate our emotions and get to know, or we should, as we appreciate our emotions, we should realize two things. The emotions don't just occur. They occur as a result of a chemical reaction. Eh? There is production of hormones within our bodies. These, uh, the hormones coupled with the neurotransmitters are, uh, are able to translate and affect the emotion you have. Sincerely, you should know, you may feel happy out of, uh, out of getting satisfied with what has gone on. But you may not know that uh, that happiness has come as a result of the neurotransmitters focused in the brain, sending a signal to whichever organ to send that satisfactory remark such that you are happy. On the other hand, you may have, or you may be sad, but the sad moment does not arise until your, body, your, your neurotransmitters within the brain have sent a signal to that particular site to produce that chemical called a hormone or the neurotransmitter to uh, notify your body that you must be sad. So similarly, I mean, in that situation, you should know that our emotions are actually uh, a result of chemical reactions, and therefore, chemistry is at play, even within your body, and in your day-to-day -day appreciation. The other aspect we should think about is the love. 
For sure. I think uh, nobody should not love because uh, when you ha don't have it, I think you have a missing component. Because otherwise, why should you hate? If you loved everyone, I think that would be the most uh, good, the best thing. And uh, definitely, uh, love does not arise out of nothing. It arises out of the actions within your body, whereof the uh, hormones, uh, vasopressin, oxytocin, are actually produced. And these are produced within your brain, and uh, there are three centers that are responsible for this. And these three centers signal the production of these hormones. And when they are produced within your body, you, get, you feel the affection for somebody. And since suddenly, that is science. And the science has produced the names and the structures of those chemicals. So don't imagine that we are simply saying uh, the chemist didn't sit down to get the structures. And therefore, even your love, your love affair with whoever you have it, is a result of a chemical component which therefore must be uh, a daily experience because certainly if you have uh, no affection for somebody, uh, probably your life may not, may, not be go, may not go on as best as expected. Uh, the other aspect we should assume or we should be able to realize is that you may cause sleep not to come as easily by taking coffee. But you should know that when you take coffee, you take in materials or a chemical that will signal the brain to delay the signaling of the sleep. And therefore, you are actually carrying out a chemical reaction within your body to stop the sleep. So there is, I think that is chemical enough, and we should be able to appreciate that when you stop the sleep from coming at that particular time, you have uh, uh, carried out a chemical reaction. Uh, we have the experience of cutting onions, but we should know that onions are very uh, wonderful materials that we use as spices. Uh, when you, you cook up the food with the onions, the taste you get will be very different from the one without the onions. That smell or that scent and the taste you get is a result of the chemicals within the onion. However, the important aspect to look at here is if you are simply cutting the onions unknowingly, you may not know that the fumes or the vapors from the onion you are cutting are able to uh, fill the, the space where you are cutting them from and you shed the tears. A good thing, or a very tasty thing, or a very uh, a pleasant thing when you are eating is causing you to cry. One would wonder why. And of course, chemists have already found out that uh, there is, or in, uh, the, first, the onion is able to produce or to accumulate first sulfates within the surface, within, from the surface and, prepare, and produce materials that can be acted on to produce uh, a, the equivalent of a tear gas or a tear causing enzyme. The enzyme uh, repairs, uh, uh, acts on that, uh, that uh, the vapors that would have entered into your eye to produce a, a, sulfur, a sulfur derivative or a sulfonate derivative that will cause you to shed tears. And in that way, definitely, that will be chemistry at its play. And it's the chemistry to explain that the shedding of your tears is a result of a chemical that has entered into your eye. Definitely, that means that whatever we consider as important in chemistry is a chemical. And therefore, that chemical uh, arising from uh, the onion will be responsible for that change. Our common aspect, in Uganda we don't have lakes that freeze, but we have seen water in a fridge freezing and we see the ice floating. But when you have butter and you put it in the fridge, the, the solid will be at the bottom. The wonder is, why does ice float Yet other substances, when they solidify, sink. In this particular situation, you cannot find the answer unless you resort to the explanations given by chemistry. In chemistry, uh, we are priv pri privileged to, understand, to appreciate that there is hydrogen bonding, a form of weak intermolecular forces of attraction that exist within the water molecules. 
When these particles or the particles of water, or we are, what we are calling the water molecules, are tracked in the solid state, the crystal structure formed uh, form is actually open because the forces of repulsion between the lone pairs of electrons on the uh, oxygen atoms and the uh, ones that are being held together do not allow the tetrahydrogeometry stru geometrical structure to form. Rather, we have an incomplete or open structure forming, and it is less dense than the water. This should be appreciated because if you have life within water, we, because we all know fish live underwater, and if the water was to freeze with the water at the bottom getting solidified fast, that would mean that all the fish would be carried to the top and eventually die. So definitely, if the fish must survive in the water, even in the cold, the water must, the solid water which is frozen must be on the top such that the fish can continue to flourish from the base. And that is one important thing explained by chemistry, but I think it is God who created that ice must float such that the life continues at the bottom. The other aspect we need to look at is we have been using detergents and soaps to clean. Sincerely, you all know what soap is. Soap is a sodium salt, a sodium or potassium salt of a long chain <coughs> carboxylic acid. In that aspect, if it is a sodium salt of a carboxylic acid, does that, does that want it to clean? Why does the sodium sulfate clean? In this situation, we should appreciate that the soaps are able to clean because they act as emulsifying agents. How? The soap has two, or the, clean, the detergent and the soap has its molecular structure divided in two common aspects or two simple ways. It has a tail and a head. The tail is hydrocarbon and the head is a charged particle, negatively charged. The high, when you are cleaning, the tail, which is a hydrocarbon, a largely hydrocarbon chain, will enter into the dirt if the dirt is also nonpolar. The kind of adsorption or the kind of absorption that takes place is such that the molecules stick out as shown in the third, the, mid, the middle point, the white, uh -huh, that point. The, when they stick inside the, 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 head, the tail sticking into the dirt, and the charged particles remaining on the surface will repel one another and lift off the dirt to give the third activity over there. Because of the repulsion of the charges on the heads that we are seeing there, they roll them into a bowl and thereby the soap acting as an emulsifying agent. And in that situation, the surface will be left clean as you can see. The original surface had the yellow dirt, the yellow dirt has been removed, and it remains clean in the final one. So that action cannot simply be explained by just looking at the soap. You need to be a chemist. You understand the souls and uh, they, how they act and how they, have act, how they have worked. However, to use soap and manufacture soap is a very simple thing. How? You simply have to have just ash, ash from the kitchen, and mix it with, so, uh, with fat and boil with water. Definitely what you get with the soap. It will be crude, but you'll have the cleaning effect. Or even if the soap is impure, it still cleans. You have seen people walking around with black soap. That soap is impure, but it still cleans. Why? Because it still obeys the principles that have been associated with the chemistry. And therefore, you have chemistry at your disposal every other day of your life. Uh, in Uganda, we do not have uh, many albinos, but they are there. Actually, you have seen albinos. You, black like me, may not suffer from ultraviolet radiation bands or skin bands, but the albinos have their skin rather not properly protected, and uh, therefore they need to protect their lives or their skins or the under the skin, the dummies. You see, we have. You, the actual problem is, I want to talk as a lay person, yet my intellect tells me that I actually know all the science, okay? So when I talk over the surface, I'm actually talking over the epidermis of the human skin, which, uh, for, uh, which you should appreciate has layers below, including the dermis and the other layers. Uh, the ultraviolet radiations uh, on, on impeding 
the body of an unprotected skin, like that of the albinos, will penetrate deep inside and cause uh, damage to the tissue below the epidermis. However, scientists using zinc oxide or complex compounds like those formed of zinc oxide and titanium oxide have, pro, have manufactured what are called, what are referred, substances referred to as sunscreens. A sunscreen is just a sin, it would be like lotion. You smear over your skin and these ultraviolet rays are deflected away such that you are un they are unable to penetrate your skin. As shown in the illustration over there, without the, uh, the sunscreen, the ultraviolet rays will enter and penetrate to damage the tissue below the epidermis. When you have the sunscreen, as is shown in this other person rubbing on the surface of the skin, you will have the skin protected and the rays will be deflected away. And as they are deflected away, the complexes we have talked about, made out of titanium oxide and zinc oxide, will have saved your life. But how many people are using sunscreens and are not aware that it's a chemical principle that they are utilizing? Sincerely, that's chemistry in our midis. Our next. Uh, we are challenged with the one or two important things that are commonly used in the baking industry. As I said earlier, you may not be baking at your home, but we actually eat or enjoy uh, fluffy foods uh, when they are freshly cooked or freshly baked. The rise of such materials are a result of some chemical reactions. You have your dough, you have mixed it with the baking powder or the baking soda. When you mix it with the baking soda, be sure, uh, of course it will be tough and hard. Those, the, the, what you buy it as hard and tough are made with baking soda. But the ones that you eat and are soft with fluffy material are baked with free, the baking powder. The baking powder is a mixture of sodium bicarbonate and uh, tar, tartaric acids or tartar uh, ingredients uh, that can easily cause release. The rise of the dough is a result of a reaction between the acid within the ingredients that are put and this bicarbonate producing carbon dioxide. The molecules of carbon dioxide trapped within the solid cause the dough to rise. And of course, if you have been baking and you're not aware that that's chemistry at play, I wonder what we must do to tell you that chemistry does almost everything we do in life. <coughs> I believe that I've uh, tried to explain the difference between baking soda and the sodium of the, uh, the baking powder. My other interest is, uh, I hope that we are all aware that food can go bad. If food goes bad, and we are saying these are materials we must feed on uh, to keep our lives going, what must we know? We should know that food goes bad, one, as a result of bacteria, fungi, and other reactions, including oxygen, acting on it. For instance, if one had cooking oil and kept it for long, you'll definitely find it turning sticky. That rancidity, rancidity of cooking those liquid, uh, liquid lipids uh, oxidized to peroxo compounds, which makes the oil have a nasty smell and of course not useful for feeding. Definitely, in that situation, the reaction that transforms the oil, the, the flowing oil into a thick paste is a chemical reaction in our Middle East. Likewise, we should be able to appreciate that in that situation, the food would have gone bad and therefore would not be good for feeding on. The question is, uh, can we think about water going bad? Because if you checked a water bottle, you'll also find that there is an expiry date for that water. What does it bring to your notice? If we have said water, food can go bad by chemical reaction. What about water? Because it's just water. The question is that even water can go bad. How? The container in which you are storing it may have in some way reactions with 